Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Scott Daly with Utah Division of Water Quality. Um, I'm chair of the uh, Utah Lake Commission Technical Committee meeting. So um, welcome to the December 9th uh, meeting of the Technical Committee. So um, today we have a pretty full agenda. Tomorrow, um, this meeting is kind of in preparation of the Utah Lake Commission Governing Board meeting this tomorrow morning. Um, and so I guess with that, you know, um, I don't know, Eric, how you want to handle a round of introductions, but um, Eric or Sam, do you want to make note of the members that are here or, or just kind of skip the introduction portion and have that opportunity in the round table later? Yeah, maybe let's just do that in the round table. Carrie, okay. co-chair Carrie. Do you think we should do a round of introductions first? Um, hello. Well, yeah. Well, the hard part is, is that we, we see each other's faces, but we haven't seen each other for six months or so. <laughs> Some of you have increased facial hair. Um, I don't know. It's uh, whatever, okay. whatever the chair wants to do, I'm good with. Okay. Well, why don't I just walk through the participant list? Um, that'll know everyone that's here. Um, and then, you know, everybody will be on the same page with uh, the folks at the table. But so we have myself, uh, Sam Brigger with the commission, Eric Ellis with the commission, um, Harry Morning, uh, Amy Holt, uh, Chris Kelleher, Jared Penrod, Jeff Denblaker, Jesse Gosh, Stewart. Can everyone say who they're with? Uh, kind of responding to your announcing their name. Sure, let's do that. Um, Carrie, we'll start with you. I'm with the city of Woodland Hills. Okay. Amy Holt. Okay, well. Um, All right, sorry, it's, uh, I'm still getting used to this. It's logged in under my wife, but it's Josh Holt, park manager. Oh, okay, good morning, Josh, welcome. Um, we have a phone number, 801-483-6864. Hey, that, uh, this is Jesse Stewart. I'm with Utah Lake Water Users and Salt Lake City. I'm doing audio through my phone and video through my computer. So. Gotcha. Good morning, Jesse. Jared Penrod. Hey, I'm with uh, Provo City. Okay. Chris Kelleher. Sorry, I was hitting the uh, wrong unmute button. Um, I'm with the Department of Natural Resources and Marine Software okay. Program. Good morning, Chris. Uh, Jeff Demblaker. I'm with Jacobs Engineering. Okay. Good morning, Jeff. Mike Rao. Hi, I'm here with Central Utah Water Conservancy District. Okay. Good morning, Mike. Morgan Faulkner. Good morning. I'm with Forest Street Fire and State Lands. Okay. Good morning, Reed Price. Morning uh, with Orem. Okay, morning, Reed. Uh, I have Russell's iPhone. Russell, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, sorry, trying to add to that. It's Russ Franklin. I'm with Central Utah Water Conservancy District, and I have my phone and my computer because I'm in the office and I don't have a camera or okay. a microphone on my computer. Okay, excellent. Good morning, Russ. Um, Ryan V. Hi, uh, Ryan Van Gotham with CPRO. Okay. Morning, Ryan. Sarah Carroll. Hi, I'm with City of Saratoga Springs Planning. Okay. Morning, Sarah. Scott Schuler. Uh, hi, I'm also with CPRO. Thank you. Okay. Morning. Shelly, Shelly Turnbow. I'm sorry. Good morning. I'm with the city of Provo. Okay. Good morning, Shelley. Welcome. Um, Sullivan Love. Uh, I'm uh, with the city of Vineyard. Thank you. Okay. Um, TJ Munger. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Todd Munger from Lehigh City. Okay. Good morning, Todd. Travis Jockmanson. Jockum. Jockmanson. Sorry, yeah. apologies for that. Oh, you're good. I'm with Payson City. Okay, morning, Travis. 
And then I think the last one I have here is Russell Franklin or Russ Blank Franklin. Yeah, that's just the computer. I already introduced myself. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, are there any any others that I've missed? Scott, I, I think you missed me. I'm Michael Mills. I'm here presenting for the June Sucker Recovery Implementation Program this morning, but I am now with the Utah Reclamation Mitigation and Conservation Commission. Good morning, Mike. Apologies for that. I don't know how I would miss you. <laughs> no worries. Great. Well, welcome everyone. Appreciate that. Um, I think I'll just do a quick run through the agenda just generally, and then we'll jump right in. Um, you know, we'll take a minute to review the and approve the minutes from the June 17th meeting. It's been a little bit since uh, we met last time. Um, I'll have an opportunity to present an update on uh, some work with the Utah Lake Water Quality Study related to um, development of management goals for the lake. Uh, we'll turn the time over to Eric Ellis for um, the director's report. There are several items there. Um, then uh, we'll turn to SE Pro for the algal treatment uh, pilot study, kind of report out on their efforts for this summer. Um, Sam will give us a brief update on the communication plan. Uh, Mike, as he indicated, will um, provide an update in the June Sucker Recovery Program. We'll have an opportunity for a roundtable and then um, a general comments uh, opportunity for public uh, comment. And then we'll just do a brief overview of the meeting schedule over the next little while. Uh, any comments or questions on the agenda? Anything else? folks would like to kind of flag. Okay, well, great. With that, just give me a moment here and I will pull up my presentation and we'll turn to the first item, update on the Utah Lake Water Quality Study. Um, are you all seeing my screen? Hey, Scott, real quick. Sure. The first oh, item of introductions is actually approving the minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I just said it too. I'm just getting ahead of myself. I'm so <laughs> anxious good, to good. talk about that other part of work. Um, okay, so here are the minutes. Are you all seeing the minutes? Um, any comments or questions from uh, members of the technical committee? Take any clarifications or edits, so folks, if you've had a chance to review them. Okay, well, hearing none, I'll uh, ask for a motion to approve them. So moved. Okay, um, do I have a second? Second. I'm sorry, who Sullivan. was? Sullivan, thank you, Sullivan. Thank you, Carrie. Um, okay, well, I guess I'll just ask then for all in favor to approve the, to, to approve the minutes. Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Are there any opposed? Okay. Well, with that, uh, I think we have approval of the June minutes. Okay. Sam, is there anything else you need in that regard? Nope, I got everything recorded. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, now we'll uh, transition to the uh, Utah Lake Water Quality Study update. Okay. okay, is the slide deck showing for everyone? That's great. Okay, perfect. Well, um, we'll get into some details here, but just generally, you know, the, there's been a significant component of work with Utah Lake Water Quality Study, you know, beginning really um, with some conversations with the steering committee back in the late winter of spring of 2020. And there's been a significant effort of the steering committee and the science panel um, since then, just kind of wrapping up in the last week or so to um, develop this concept of management goals for the lake. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what that means as we get into the conversation here. Um, and then how that relates to the overall project. But um, the intention here is, you know, we're providing an update on the management goals and then you know, given that the product has was approved by the steering committee uh, in their last meeting uh, that was last week, um, 
we'll be taking the set of management goals, a document to the governing board tomorrow um, to seek their endorsement of the product. Um, and so that's kind of the, kind of the overview and uh, purpose of today's presentation. Um, just kind of provide an update to the technical committee on where things stand. Um, so just to provide some context, um, and you've all seen this before, um, you know, this, the steering committee, um, it's been a year and a half or more ago, developed a set of high level charge questions um, to evaluate, you know, to send to the science panel um, to have them evaluate the historical condition of the lake um, to provide some context for uh, what nutrients might be, how the nutrients might be affecting the lake, help provide some context for uh, potential improvements that we might see for certain adjustments in nutrient management and so on. Um, some questions related to the current conditions of the lake. So, you know, how is the lake operating now? What do nutrients mean for harmful algal blooms? Um, how are they impacting the uses and those kinds of things? And then, you know, are there additional pieces of information that are needed to help with the project, the overall purpose of the Utah Lake Water Quality Study, which is to develop numeric nutrient criteria for nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and then there is this fourth high level charge question um, that is in the mix. And, you know, and that is to evaluate whether or not uh, an improved stable state can be achieved under the current management constraints. Um, so water management, fishery management, um, climate, and so on. And with this set of high level charge questions, the science panel spent a significant amount of time fleshing out very specific scientific questions for each one of these, um, resulting in a you know, several page document that really became the um, really became the foundation of the strategic research plan document. So the science panel and their evaluation of those charge questions has worked through um, assessing the information that's available to them, either literature or data or modeling and so on, to help uh, provide answers to those questions back to the steering committee. Um, in, the, in that process, they've developed an assessment of data gaps, so determining any deficiencies in the information to help answer those questions, and then ultimately ending up with a prioritization of research needs or data needs um, that they need to fill to help improve their confidence in um, reporting out on those, on those charge questions. And so the table that's provided here is a, an assessment of those uh, big picture research needs um, in order of priority and a low ranking on the right hand side is uh, a high priority project. Um, we went through several iterations with the science panel to uh, rank these projects, refine them, um, and re-rank the projects and ultimately ending up with a strategic research plan that was adopted by the science panel um, early last spring. And I'll point out a couple of things here that the prioritized research needs, the order of the list that you see on the right, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the, an indication of the overall importance of the project. Um, there are other aspects of the project that are more important to understand or might not necessarily be in this order. Uh, but the science panel determined that they had sufficient information and didn't need to prioritize the, those particular areas for uh, additional study or additional data. Um, and in one, you know, one example of that is the item number 18, the additional atmospheric deposition data, um, ranked pretty low on the list, but only because the science panel recognized that there's a significant effort by the Wasatch Front Water Quality Council to uh, continue or to implement a large scale atmospheric deposition monitoring program to provide Utah Lake specific data on that front. So uh, the results of that will be included in the high priority number one, um, the internal and external mass balances. So just one thing to point out. And the last kind of note here is that it's an adaptive document, you know, and the document will need to change as new information's new information becomes available as you know, different questions are asked from the steering committee. Um, you know, there's a need to adapt and change direction based on information as it becomes available. The overall big picture of the technical work elements, um, this is kind of the work that's in front of the science panel right now and how that fits in with everything we've been talking about. 
you know, on the far right there, you'll see strategic research plan um, and then several other items. So that SRP was based off of the data characterization and conceptual models that I've talked to this group about uh, assessment of data gaps, uncertainty analysis, um, and an exploratory research plan. Uh, so those elements are, you know, mostly completed. Uh, I'll highlight the framework component here that's kind of almost center in the screen. And that's important because um, the framework document, which is the approach for the approach the science panel will take for compiling all of the information and data and models to develop the actual numeric criteria uh, is outlined in that framework document. And this management goals discussion uh, originated from um, the steering committee's review of the framework. Um, and so that's um, the framework's really kind of the core reason why the steering committee's taken on this effort over the last year or so to develop the management goals. And then the product of the management goals will go into uh, that framework document. It's just a general overview of um, you know, what we mean by management goals. Um, you know, across this table in the middle here, we have kind of three general categories, uh, aquatic life, recreation, agricultural, secondary water. And these are really equivalent to the um, beneficial des designated beneficial uses that are in the Utah Water Quality Act that the Division of Water Quality manages all waters for, essentially. Utah Lake has these specific uses of water, so we protect for uh, aquatic life, including the entire warm water fishery, waterfowl, shorebirds, uh, including that is the June sucker, uh, recreation, so boaters, fishers, swimmers, et cetera, water skiers, and then agricultural uses of water um, and irrigation livestock. And I'll just point out here, I'm noticing that secondary water for homes is included in the agricultural uh, secondary water part. Uh, that's recently been edited to remove that particular use. Um, that's considered in our fourth category that's not shown here, and that is downstream uses of Utah Lake water. So once the water leaves Utah Lake, goes into the Jordan River, where it can be used for all of these things, the aquatic life in the Jordan River, recreational uses in the Jordan River, uh, agricultural diversions from the Jordan, and also for other uses like secondary residential irrigation water, uh, where we have you know, sometimes kids running through sprinklers and, you know, putting it on vegetable gardens and stuff like that, that are not really captured in this agricultural water use. So these, these beneficial uses really serve as the high level um, framework for those management goals. And then within each one of these, the steering committee's gone through a process to evaluate more specific management goals that fall within those categories. And so and just keep that in mind when we get into a couple examples here. Um, okay, so just some quick definitions for the management goals, and I won't spend too much time on this, but basically management goals are just statements about how um, we would like the lake to function. You know, what, what goals, either social or economic, do we have for the lake? Do we want people to be able to swim freely without uh, worry of being exposed to harmful algal blooms? Uh, do we want the lake water to be clean enough that it doesn't impact economic um, initiatives and so on? And so these are value-based decisions. Uh, they're oftentimes directional, meaning um, you know, improvements to water quality or in uh, increase in recreational uses. Um, so they're kind of directional goals. And they'll, you'll see this in, um, in the materials that the steering committee developed. Kind of skip over the assessment endpoints, but the other big item here is the measure. So this is the specific parameter that uh, has been identified that the uh, that will be used to assess whether or not water quality conditions are moving in the right direction towards achieving those goals, right? Are you making progress? And so for the, um, you know, for the June sucker or other warm water fishery, example might be improvements to the, you know, you need sufficient dissolved oxygen concentrations to support a reproducing community of June sucker. And the measure there would be dissolved oxygen and you would measure, you would track progress to see if dissolved oxygen conditions were improving in a sufficient way. Um, and in that particular example, I'll just move on the targets. There are some of those 
um, that have specific values that are identified in the Clean Water Act and the Utah Water Quality Act. Dissolved oxygen is one of those uh, along with pH. And so we've, there's already a threshold for a minimum amount of dissolved oxygen, for example, in the lake. Uh, but there are others. And as we get into the management goals document, you'll see that not all um, and actually most of the management goals and most of the measures don't have targets associated with them and they're to be determined throughout the Utah Lake Water Quality Study process. So a quick example to kind of, you know, I'll open the document here in a minute, but it's um, admittedly cumbersome and has a bit of overwhelming amount of information. Um, but the example of the table is kind of organized by each of those uses on the left um, and then has specific goals developed for each of those uses and then lines out the measure in the next column or the targets and measures and assessment endpoints and then identifies uh, in some cases additional information or guidance that can be used to help derive those. Okay, so a little bit more about the process for how this conversation's unfolded. I had mentioned that the steering committee reviewed and commented on a, on a draft framework document last winter. Um, there were some significant comments coming out of that process uh, where many members um, you know, question what the management goals were. This idea of management goals were referenced in the framework, but there were, really wasn't any specific information included in the framework document to spell out what the management goals are. Um, kind of at the same time, the science panel has been working along, you know, and asking this question, well, ask, asking a question of the steering committee, tell us how, what you want us to shoot for in terms of water quality conditions, and then we can tell you how to get there and how hard it is to get there, right? Um, but on the other hand, the steering committee is asking the question, what's possible, right? And so to try to bridge the gap, um, you know, the steering committee took on this effort to come up with some potential endpoints or goals for the lake um, that the science panel can evaluate throughout the process. Um, Steering committee members individually met one-on-one -on -one with um, the steering committee co-chairs. So Eric Ellis is a co-chair of that committee, along with uh, Erica Gaddis, uh, my director. And so they led an interview process, um, developed pages and pages of notes, uh, kind of notating all of those unique interests and what their particular goal aspirations are. And then we took that information and compiled it into this management goals document that went through several rounds of review with the steering committee. Um, and then an important note with that, um, the steering committee asked for some supporting information from the science panel to assess whether or not the goal was relevant to the purpose of uh, deriving nutrient criteria, uh, whether or not we had sufficient information, um, if there's additional measures or targets that should be considered uh, and then several other more specific questions that I can get into here in a little bit. Um, and then just kind of ending up, science panel worked, you know, the last month and a half or so to evaluate those questions, report it out in a document to the steering committee. The steering committee had a couple meetings over the last several weeks, ending with um, an adoption of that document last week. So again, I guess I can probably skip over this here, just the overview where recreation or the management goals are organized by these higher level um, aquatic or higher level water quality uses and the downstream uses for Utah Lake. And then with that, I think I'll uh, transition to a document here. Let's see here. I can find it in my long list of open documents. Okay, hang on just a second. There we go. Okay, has the screen transitioned? Yeah, okay, thank you. First two pages of the goals document. Okay, great. So this is the final product coming out of the steering committee deliberations. Um, so I just cover page. And one of the things, we'll just pause here on the executive summary, um, kind of the take home messages 
are in the middle of the page here with the bulleted list. Um, so this is really a high level summary of the management goals that were identified for each of those uses and the downstream uh, uses. Um, kind of in line with the things that we talked about a couple minutes ago, but you know, for the recreation, um, managing the magnitude, extent, and frequency of phytoplankton blooms. Uh, so here the steering committee is concerned with both um, green algae and cyanobacteria and their influence on water quality conditions and, and their influence on how recreationists um, use the lake. Protection of public health is front and center. So the impacts that toxins, uh, harmful algal bloom toxins might have on recreational users. And then uh, public perception was another big category. So um, how people perceive the lake and making improvements in that regard for um, improving future, future willingness of folks to visit the lake. Aquatic life use, um, again here that kind of broke down into protections for the June sucker, um, improving habitat conditions for the June sucker and Utah Lake fishes. Um, protections for toxins and their potential impacts on fish, uh, either through mortality or uh, fish reproduction. Uh, waterfowl and shorebirds are uh, very important goals to manage for um, that were identified by the steering committee. And then, um, yeah, just to mention there of the water quality standards. Uh, agriculture, this one was mostly just specifically focused on the um, effects that toxins may have on uh, livestock and irrigated crops. And so managing to ensure that the lake um, doesn't have toxins and concentrations that will impact um, livestock or crops in a negative way. And then those downstream uses that I mentioned a minute ago. Okay. And Eric, as I'm going through here, um, I don't know if there's something in particular that you wanna point out um, as I'm walking through the table uh, but maybe I'll just focus on, um, you know, a couple examples here. Um, this particular table is focusing on primary contact recreation. There's several pages to this table in the document. Uh, it's quite a lengthy list. Um, the first one here is uh, that harmful algal blooms will not create toxins that threaten public health. Um, the assessment endpoints were identified as toxin concentrations. And the specific measures are uh, individual toxins that we do find in, in Utah Lake or that potentially could be in Utah Lake. Um, those particular ones do have targets assigned just because there are some target values identified by um, an EPA evaluation or EPA uh, criteria recommendation document. Um, so that's the toxin portion of it. The next goal down in the second column is that the current occurrence of HABs is limited in spatial extent and infrequent so that the recreation community is supported. So here we're assessing for um, the magnitude, frequency, and duration of harmful algal blooms in the lake. Um, and the things that the measures of the steering committee identified here are annual number of lake closures due to HABs. So they want to make sure the lake is open and available for folks. Um, duration and frequency uh, of nuisance algal blooms. So looking at cyanobacteria and green algae across the lake. Improvements to the submersible recreation, fishing, um, swimming beaches and shoreline access areas are open without nuisance, algae or public health advisories. Um, we have a series of water quality standards for the recreational water quality standards are supported. Um, increase in recreational opportunities and experiences. So this is related to lake visitation and improving um, the visitation willingness of folks to come out to the lake. And then their uh, sport fish are safe for human consumption. So just uh, noting the idea that you know, have toxins might affect how, um, how fish are safely consumed. Okay. And Scott, we've got about 10 minutes. Got okay, about great. Um, I assume that this would take a little, <laughs> take a, more time than I thought, but um, so similar information for the recreational use, um, or I'm sorry, for the aquatic life use, we look at warm water fishery, um, food abundance available to the fishery, the effects of algal toxins on the fishery, uh, macrophyte habitat, 
for support of June sucker, and then identification and a notation that carp populations in the lake are important to track for their impact to one nutrient cycling in the lake, but also uh, for their direct impact to the June sucker. Um, similar for the waterfowl and shorebirds, agricultural uses, and then downstream uses. Um, and I'll just quickly flip to you flip to the um, science panel product here real quick. So the science panel was asked a series of questions from the steering committee um, to help evaluate whether or not these were goals and measures were appropriate. Um, and those are just kind of listed right here. So are they, are the measures responsive to nutrients which can be quantified, um, which measures are gonna be considered by ongoing science panel work? Are there additional me measures? Uh, kind of those things that I overviewed a minute or two ago. Um, and then talking about uh, which ones, identification of those that are gonna be difficult to develop targets for, um, how we might go about assessing the conditions in the lake, and then also um, if there are additional targets or measures that should be included. And so the science panel worked through um, several meetings to try to evaluate that information and ended up with um, a document that has um, kind of a, a summary of their findings. Uh, and in general, you know, they found that um, most of the measures were directly responsive to nutrients and worth considering in the context of uh, management goals. They did highlight some additional measures to consider for some of them. Um, so adding in uh, a couple of toxins that weren't specifically listed, uh, additional measures or indicators of dissolved oxygen uh, that were included in there, uh, a couple additional measures of um, cyanobacteria. So instead of just looking at densities, we look at um, relative bio volume and the relative densities of those because um, they might provide slightly different answers. Um, and so the other part of what, they'd, what they've done here is to evaluate whether or not the goal itself, um, you know, establishment of goals is more the responsibility of the steering committee, but the steering committee was interested in hearing the science panel's assessment of whether or not the goal made sense for the purpose of the project. And so they provided an evaluation of uh, all of those goals. And, um, you know, in, in general, I think all of them were directly relevant. Um, there are some mix, mixed results for the carp population, right? So for, you know, the aspect of the carp influences on the June sucker through uh, destroying vegetation and competition for food sources is not directly a, a nutrient issue, a nutrient uh, management issue. Um, but the carp ability to recycle or roll in recycling nutrients from the sediments and uh, through their biomass is. So they had identified some mixed results there. Um, science panel also went through each of those measures that we were talking about. That's the, the left column here and uh, made the assessments to each of those questions. I'll point out that I know you didn't have a lot of time to read the question list in too much detail, but there were two questions within the um, two sub questions to number two uh, to evaluate the relationships between nutrients and cyanobacteria densities and the relationships between uh, cyanobacteria densities and toxins that are produced by them. Uh, there were two questions that the science panel didn't have quite enough information and hadn't done quite enough work to be able to report out on those at this time. Uh, and really those are two questions that are at the heart of the Utah Lake Water Quality Study and will be evaluated as, uh, as we move along. So I guess with, um, with that, maybe we'll just um, talk next steps here real quick. And are you seeing, is my presentation back up? Last page of your I'm sorry, Eric. It's still well, showing your doc. Oh, is it? Okay. I'm trying to. Might have to. Um, here, let me. You may have. There we go. Okay, so just um, just to talk quickly about the next steps. Um, you know, assuming uh, 
the governing board is on board with the uh, management goals. Uh, next steps are to incorporate these management goals into the framework document to kind of cross check all of those measures with the measures that are listed in the framework. Um, add any of those that are not already in there to the list, um, make some adjustments to the um, strategic research plan as necessary, and then uh, really just continue with the evaluation of data and information um, and, uh, implementation of the strategic research plan. And then um, we hope to start initiating kind of the next steps of this work, kind of, um, you know, this diagram shows the work elements that are on the table right now. There are uh, a series of additional work elements that we're going to, we hope to initiate here soon to um, take us from where we're at now through the end of the project. And those are, um, you know, development of watershed models to help inform uh, management scenarios and evaluation of costs, evaluation of feasibility, um, derivation of the actual numbers, so um, actual work to combine the information and start deriving criteria, uh, the approach for implementing it, um, development of the in-lake water quality models. There's a whole series of a list of things that um, big ticket items that are kind of on the docket next for that next phase of work. So I guess with that, I'll, I'll take any questions, uh, recognizing that that is it's an overwhelming amount of information uh, in like six different documents to put on the screen in, in 20 minutes. So my apologies for that, um, but I am definitely interested to hear if there are any questions. Hey, Scott. Yeah. Two people requested in the chat if we can send out these slides afterwards. If you want to send it to Eric or I, we can make sure we get that out to them, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can do that for sure. Okay. Well, hearing no questions. Um... I just wanted to say thank you for all of the work that's been put into this. It's a, it's a complicated, um, task for for most of us and it's nice that you have been able to put it into a format that is easy to to read and to understand so thank you okay great appreciate that um so know that it's uh <laughs> it's not just uh overwhelming for those that aren't involved day to day um so yeah it's definitely been interesting work it's been i think really i, I enjoy walking through this process, uh, the folks that are at the table um, make this a really fun project for me. So I'm really happy for that. And it's great to see some progress in this, um, you know, this particular effort that's been going on for, you know, almost a year or so. So, all right. Um, I guess with that, we'll turn to Eric for the uh, director's update. And Eric, were you going to share your screen? Oh, Eric, you're on mute. Oh, there we go. It hides it when you share your screen. Sorry. <laughs> okay, is the screen shared? It is. Okay, great. And you're just seeing, are you seeing presentation mode or are you seeing the other kind? It's your slide deck there. Um, yeah, we're seeing presentation mode. Okay. All right, so uh, I'm gonna try to be kind of quick, um, just do some a few reports. Uh, one of those is that the last time we met, we were in a fantastic position water-wise. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you wanna contribute, but the lake has come down. We're at about three feet below full uh, and, and the water, Outlook doesn't look awesome, but I'm hoping Mike, Mike or someone else from Central Utah could jump in and change our minds on, on what the water outlook looks like. Uh, I can chime in. I don't know if I'll change your mind at all, but um, yeah, Utah Lake bottomed out in October um, at the end of the irrigation season at about 3.2 feet below compromise. Um, it's now just a little bit above three feet. Um, so it's slowly filling. Um, the upstream reservoirs on the Provo, Deer Creek and Jordan L are both around 70% full. Um, so we're, we're not in a horrible position 
as far as reservoir levels. Um, but we, we are going to need some snow this winter. And so far, um, we're off to almost the worst start to a water year we've seen in a long time. So um, we're in the second to fifth percentile range on the Provo for snowpack right now. So um, there's a lot of months left. So hopefully, hopefully that trend will change, but we are going to need some snow here before too long. Uh, I did notice that strawberry still has lots of water, which was good to know because that's a pretty vital reservoir up there. But, but yeah, uh, we, we listened to a climate review through the drought contingency planning meeting recently and, and this year's not looking awesome. So pray for lots of, of snow in the mountains. Uh, Walkera Way, uh, we've talked with this group previously about this uh, project down on the west side of, of Orem, south of Vineyard and kind of tucked between Provo and Vineyard. Uh, work has been done. Uh, here's a few photos of the pilot study area. Fencing has begun on that. This is just along the edge of the Sleepy Ridge Golf Course going into the, into the Powell Slough area on the Holdaway property. Uh, we have funding for this east fence and for a majority of the, the shorter uh, segment fences. And hopefully by spring, we'll be able to get some um, cattle in there to start grazing it and so that everyone can see the, the benefits of that. Uh, we did take our commissioner elect, uh, county commissioner elect Tom Sakiewicz, out onto the project uh, this last week, week and he is a huge supporter of that and of Utah Lake, which was really nice to hear. And he'll be looking for ways uh, as a commissioner to support the lake in, in every way that he can. Uh, we are working with uh, Representative Brady Brammer uh, this year for a legislative request. Uh, and that will be to essentially finalize the funding for the Wakaraway project. So phase one uh, trails anyway, we're funded this year uh, through Mountain Light Association of Governments. That was a $4 million grant to cover the trailheads at either end. So one in Vineyard, one in Orem that ties between the, the south end of the Vineyard Community Trail and ties right over by the, it'll kind of split where it meets in Orem. One will connect with the Community Trail right down the street from the Front Runner Station. And, and then just barely extended from there is the the tail end of University Parkway. So folks will have two options when they get to the Orem end of the trail. Uh, and that covers the cost of, again, those trailheads, uh, a bridge or two where it needs to cross the, the Orem River or Orem Effluent um, Canal, and then take it out across the this project area, which is going to be beautiful. The, the areas cleaning up nicely and, and with cattle in there to kind of graze down the remaining Phragmites, it'll be beautiful, so. Eric? Yes. Um, I know that the legislative budget's going to be pretty tight again this year, because, especially because of COVID. I don't know if there's any way in your presentation to the, to the committee that you can tie in um, recreational opportunities and being outside as a, <clears throat> as a relief from COVID and that might uh, allow us to request uh, additional funding um, as an outdoor venue. I love it. Not. Well, there's, there's, this isn't the only work being done right there along the vineyard frontage that will create that outdoor recreation. This sort of finishes up the project. The county has put a lot of dollars into improving this area so that there are outdoor venues and I'll, I'll certainly make a point of of that as being a healthy alternative during, you know, times where we're supposed to be avoiding direct contact with others. It's a great option. I'm in full support of that. So thank you. Great idea. Uh, just to point out, we kind of mentioned this, the trail funding, funding that Mountainland Association of Governments approved this year, uh, those dollars become available in 2023. And it's two sections actually. One, one is the phase one of Wakara Way. The second uh, is a, a longer stretch from 
the current approximately the the Timpanoga Special Service District uh, all the way to the west where it, where the existing Lakeshore Trail terminates at the Loch Lomond uh, Park. So that this is close to five miles of trail uh, that was funded up there and it'll go on top of the the existing easement for uh, their sewer main uh, and kind of provide manhole covers for them to be able to access their their pipeline and and then provide a great great location for Lakeshore Trail up along that north end of the lake. Uh, also, uh, just to clarify, uh, we talked about the the county uh, support and and investment into the lake. Uh, I don't know, almost a year ago now, we presented to the Tourism Tax Advisory Board uh, and they loved the projects that were presented. They recommended those to go to the county and just barely we have, we just had at the last county commission meeting, uh, the, the last two of those projects were committed in contract uh, and those will roll out over the next three years. So the, the vineyard project will, will commence immediately. The Saratoga Springs project will, will start about a year from now. And then the American Fork project uh, should be wrapping up sometime in 2023. Uh, and those were kind of, that was at a request of one of the, the tax advisory board members to kind of spread those out and so that folks can see great progress happening year after year uh, out on the lake. It doesn't prevent them from starting a little early, it just kind of more dictates when the when they'll wrap up. So really exciting projects. Those are the kind of brief overview photos of what those will look like. Um, but increasing the tourism element of, of our access points and and their usability to, to locals and, and visitors as well. Uh, one last kind of a wrap up on the, our shoreline restoration work. Does it, I wonder if this will do I have to unshare and then pull that one back up? Yeah, you'll have to switch screens. Stop share. Okay, are you seeing the Utah Lake Shoreline Soils Assessment? Yes. Yes. Okay. This is... Let me click into it. Maybe it doesn't like that I'm sharing it. Okay, so this is for everyone to use for planning purposes. Just commission and commission. I put it. I put the sign in information on your on your agenda. Uh, these are all the points that were done. This is an online story map. <clears throat> there is photography, as you see in the left hand column there. Uh, at each of these points, uh, you can click on a point. It talks about uh, details of that specific nature. Uh, if you take a little bit of time, you can. Uh, you can sort through this story map. It gives uh, the option to filter for soil types around the lakeshore. Uh, we are using it for our WRI uh, application, our uh, shoreline restoration planning work, uh, so that we can hone in on areas where we should be doing reseedings. Uh, also, avoid areas that are less less uh, beneficial for wetland type uh, habitat, uh, and would encourage anyone that is doing any work around the lake to kind of use this as a resource uh, for uh, planning purposes. Uh, shortly, we'll have a, the option to uh, have a notes box that anyone can participate with. And if you've done work on that area or if you have suggestions of, of potential uses, uh, throw that in the, in the box as you go around and and have information on the various different locations on the lake shore. Uh, you have the link. Uh, it should be live for now, unless we have it re-hosted with the county. And if we move that, we'll, we'll share that with you as well. 
And let me just make sure that we've got this wrapped up. Uh, one last topic that we wanted to mention, uh, the uh, adopt a, or sorry, the uh, life jacket loaner program. Uh, this kicked off earlier this year uh, in the fall and was a huge success. 190 life jackets were donated. Another $1,700 uh, are in our bank account waiting to be used for either life jackets or some supplies. Uh, we had 11 mentions in the news. Uh, lots and lots of folks uh, were reached on social media through this outreach effort, 20,000 plus. And uh, it really was a, a cool success. And now we have over the winter months, we're working with uh, the family of the, the two young ladies that passed away on the lake this summer uh, to develop the, what the loaner program stations will look like uh, and our marinas and get those installed. And we'll now have jackets to stock those with so that if, if people come to the lake and they don't have a jacket, they're welcome to take one uh to use for the day and they're also welcome to to leave a jacket uh to save someone else later down the road uh if they have extras or or are feeling that they could uh share a few so more to come on that as we wrap up the designs on that uh sam has taken the lead on this and has done a an amazing job with our outreach of it and, and making it successful so 190 life jackets doesn't sound like a lot but it is fully packed our upstairs storage. Uh, it's an impressive looking pile of, of jackets and I think that it should be uh, impactful for lake users down the road. With that, I'll end and turn it back to Scott. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. Um, are there any questions for Eric and his report? Hey, Eric, I have one question. Um, on the cattle grazing aspect of the Wakara Way project, um, I just may have missed it, but is there a plan in place to keep manure out of the out of the lake um, where there's such an effort and concern with phosphorus in the lake? Um, seems like we wouldn't want to have a, a good amount of manure right there so close to the water, but I may have just missed that part. Uh, yeah, great question. So two things, two parts of the the plan as far as using grazing as a management tool. One is that uh, no additional uh, material or feed will be brought down to on, on site. So anything that's being eaten will be, will be existing vegetation on the site. So it's going to utilize phosphorus that's, that's being taken up into the Phragmites and other vegetation, go through the cows and, and there'll be a smaller amount that's coming out. And then the second portion is that the fence line, there will be an, a west fence line on that project that it goes fence line, trail, beach, or what have you out into the lake so that there's a separation between the lake and uh, the cows. Sounds good, thanks. Yep. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, well, I think with that, we'll uh, turn the time over to SE Pro for their um, update on the algal treatment pilot study from this summer. Um, who do we have with SE Pro presentation? I think Ryan will be sharing and Scott may be participating in that. Scott Shear. Okay. Yep, yep, I'll get this pulled up. Great, excellent. Ryan and Scott, if you don't mind um, doing a brief introduction uh, as you kick off your presentation, I think that would be helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Yep, I'm uh, Ryan Van Gotham. I'm a water quality technical specialist with CPRO. Uh, can everyone hear me fine? Awesome. All right. Uh, background in lake management and uh, academic background in uh, biology, studying primary productivity and uh, all things lakes. And with me uh, presenting is Scott Schuler. Hi. Yeah, I'm our uh, actually. Um, when we started this project, I was with CPRO. I'm still with CPRO, but I, um, as of last month, I'm leading a new division of CPRO called Eutrophix, whose primary function 
um, the entire function of that division is to focus on uh, harmful algal blooms and phosphorus pollution in water resources. So uh, Ryan and I are both transitioning to that division from our former roles in CPRO proper. Um, but, um, you know, we are simply a division of CPRO. So I'm leading that on a national uh, basis. Um, I've been working with water resource management for the last 27 years, uh, 17 of that with CPRO. Um, prior to that, I worked for a consulting firm in the Midwest. And uh, thank you for your time today. All right, and then as we go through, um, we'll probably just run through this uh, and then save your, your questions till the end. Um, you can throw those in the chat box too. Um, to just have those marked down and then we can discuss those. We'll get rolling. Uh, so what's at stake, uh, like, like Scott's uh, been talking about, uh, we're trying to meet these management goals for Utah Lake and, and not have uh, these, these harmful cyanobacteria and nutrient issues. Um, so we're going to cover today um, our, our mitigation project on harmful cyanobacteria that we did this summer, uh, what we did exactly, uh, what we learned, um, especially in relevance to Utah Lake, and then outlining some paths forward. So the sites that we did our mitigation projects at was the Utah Lake State Park and the Lincoln Beach Marina. Uh, the state park area is about 48 acres in size. Uh, the beach is about three and just under three and a half acres. Um, and these are a very small percentage of, of Utah lakes. So we did expect water exchange and currents and uh, wind driven rate waves to affect the results of this project, but definitely worth, worth doing. So we applied uh, eight different treatments across the summer between Lincoln Beach Marina and Utah Lake State Park. We utilized Sea Clear, which is an algicide and water quality enhancer product. Um, PAC-27 is a peroxide-based algicide, and FOSLOC is a phosphorus-binding uh, technology. And we did those from uh, June to September in Lincoln Beach Marina, and then uh, just August through September in Utah Lake State Park. For the results of what we saw for algae and cyanobacteria control is we successfully controlled cyanobacteria with every application that we applied. Um, in CCLAIR, we had a greater than 95% initial control on many of the treatments we did, 80% uh, average initial control. In PAC-27, we had a 93.5% initial control. So uh, these, these technologies are effective uh, for reducing the cyanobacteria. Uh, but the, the other side of the question is, is how long are those results going to last? And that's where we also looked at the longevity. Um, we saw the best reductions. Uh, we're holding uh, one to seven days to 16 days in these sites. Um, in the longevity of condition, you know, how the site looks was uh, greater than two weeks for, at best. And importantly, by doing this, the suppression of cyan bacteria, we were able to prevent that scum formation, which is really a big issue um, in accumulating those toxins. And uh, when we utilize those treatments um, in succession, so uh, overlapping the results, uh, you have, you can achieve long-term control. And um, even the difference in size between these two sites, uh, bigger areas, we're gonna have better results and especially taking this out to larger scale on Utah Lake. Um, so kind of show you some of the some of the uh, actual photos from the treatments. So Lincoln Beach Marina at one of our, our treatments, there was a very large phantasomenon bloom outside, uh, pushed its way inside the marina. Um, this was right at the start of August, and I think that might have been the biggest bloom of the summer. Uh, before treatment, it was uh, pretty dense uh, inside the marina. Um, and after we applied the sea clear one day after, um, things really cleared up. You can definitely tell the difference in, in the water color there. And by two days after, uh, I believe we had an increase in water clarity of about six inches. At the Utah Lake State Park, um, we utilized uh, just sea clear uh, before treatment. Uh, There's a bit of algae and cyanobacteria, um, and we took some good photos across the this whole uh, month that we were there. And just to sh show you a snapshot, here's just the first treatment. Uh, we had greater than 95% control 
uh, a week out and cyan bacteria work their way towards pretreatment levels by that two week period. And that's when our next application occurred. And what that looked like, uh, just looking at the site in particular, if we look at that whole month where we applied three treatments, um, we were able to uh, keep cyan bacteria down and at low levels, especially compared to uh, the, the water in Utah Lake outside of the marina. So we took some of the chlorophyll data from the, from the data buoys and compared that to our chlorophyll data. And it was much lower. Uh, the, the chlorophyll data for out in the lake is the green line and the chlorophyll uh, from inside the state park that we managed is the blue line. And that's also verified with some of the, the cyan data, uh, satellite imagery as well. So we saw with our treatments in relevance to the water quality, um, there was little change in, in standard water quality parameters like the pH, alkalinity, water hardness, um, but the nutrients in dissolved oxygen uh, was variable for a number of reasons, uh, just the small nature of the sites, water exchange and biological activity. With CClear, uh, the total phosphorus reductions that we expected were not clear in the data um, due to those water exchange that, that I talked about before. Um, but with, with most of these treatments, we did see an improvement in that, in that water clarity, like I was talking about before. Um, and in some of the treatments, we did see a bump in the free reactive phosphorus four days after uh, sometimes. Um, and with FOSLOC, this is our phosphorus binding technology. We were able to reduce uh, phosphorus at Lincoln Beach Marina by 54% and not have an impact on the other water quality parameters. Um, impact 27, we didn't see an impact here on, on standard parameters uh, like pH. And the, uh, in a, I guess, release of phosphorus from algae, we didn't really see that because we, we paired that with, with FOSLOC. And uh, C-Clear is a, um, an algicide that uses copper. And so we did have to meet copper compliance. And we did do that with all our applications of C-Clear. Um, by the um, water quality standards, we had to stay under uh, 29 uh, micrograms per liter, about 29, by four days after. And we were able to meet that, no problem. And we also looked at so what's that exposure um, across time at one of our, our treatments. And so that's that's on the right where you can see um, on the x-axis we have our uh, time after application in hours and then the y-axis we have the copper in micrograms per liter PPB. And you can see that that quickly decreases um, below that threshold we have to meet by 36 hours. So uh, no problem meeting that, that four day standard. So what we learned and demonstrated from, from our treatments in general is we effectively reduce cyanobacteria in Utah Lake, uh, the different species we have out here, the water chemistry. Uh, the longevity is gonna be variable, um, but it will be better at larger scale uh, than these demonstration uh, sites that we used. So we're expecting about three weeks plus, uh, probably a little bit longer on those early season applications versus your late season. And these treatments uh, will have a negligible risk to the human to humans and the environment on, on Utah Lake. And uh, Utah Lake is, is uh, pretty unique in the fact that it, it does have a problem uh, with nutrients and phosphorus. Uh, phosphorus is a limiting nutrient to, to grow. And just to kind of put that in, into perspective, uh, one pound of phosphorus can support 500 pounds of algae growth um, in, in most systems. So. And when you got a lot of phosphorus, you got a lot of potential uh, for cyanobacteria and algae. And so with Utah Lake, uh, we do have elevated loading of phosphorus into the lake. Uh, this has been well documented and studied. Um, the Utah Lake sediments also are extremely high in phosphorus. Um, this was uh, known more recently and also uh, in a paper just as recent as 2019. And what they found is the majority of, of that phosphorus is found in iron and, and not calcium like we would expect with some of the water quality uh, parameters of Utah Lake. And this iron does bind uh, very strongly with phosphorus, but uh, it is releasable under some di different um, oxy oxygenation conditions. And there is some evidence that, that this is important as the poor water phosphorus of what's kind of available 
right now it's, it's very high relative to the water column. And uh, that, that phosphorus uh, can be released and there are studies going on right now uh, to look at how important this is uh, via sediment resuspension, uh, passive diffusion, and it can also be mobilized by the cyanobacteria so they can vertically migrate down, grab it and go back up. And uh, we'll talk about uh, a path forward here and I'll hand this off to Scott. Thank you, Ryan. So, I mean, in general, take home points are, you know, we believe aldercides are a viable short term solution. Um, you know, whether short term is, is one year or 15 years, that would be, um, you know, the determination of a large um, number of people um, involved in the management of, um, of Utah Lake. But uh, certainly they're proven around the country and around the world. Um, and, you know, would be a viable short-term solution to um, potential human health and environmental threats caused by cyanobacteria. Um, and then, but more importantly, I think longer term, um, and as uh, Scott Daly, um, you know, certainly um, highlighted some of the work being done there, um, there needs to be improvements to the watershed management and other phosphorus sources, um, as well as um, we believe from the data available so far, a significant effort made to mitigate the, um, the phosphorus that's in the sediment of Utah Lake. And um, uh, next slide, Ryan. So um, on, the, on the algicide management side of things, um, you know, certainly a large scale program could be implemented um, based on the information we have available over the last number of years. And we still have some work to do on this and would dive in, um, you know, if, if this avenue wanted to be pursued. But in essence, we're looking at treating, you know, potentially 30 to 50% of the lake at times um, in some of these peak, peak bloom conditions. And um, we would treat those in bands um, to help um, mitigate any potential for oxygen uh, loss. And, you know, Based on the information we know, it would likely take three to five treatments um, at variables of scale. Um, and so there's a pretty wide, I guess, estimate at this high level um, of one to $3 million a year is what it would likely take in algicide management to control the blooms um, across the lake. Uh, in addition to that, or, or in replace of that, you could consider um, intensive um, management with algicides at some of the, um, I guess, um, areas where there's a lot of public use and potential for exposure, such as the marinas, beaches, et cetera. Um, perhaps buffers are created around those. So, um, you know, we can definitely develop the, the, the fine details of that, but at a high level, um, you know, we could certainly do something at a variety of scales on Utah Lake. Um, the most impactful would be large scale management um, over a pretty broad area of the lake. Next slide. Um, a second tool that we see as a, as, a, as a strong fit for Utah Lake for a variety of reasons is a product we have called Foslock. Um, this is a, um, a unique product. It's a, it's a lanthanum um, in a bentonite uh, clay matrix. So it's 5% lanthanum. Um, as an active, it, this product is certified for use in drinking water by a number of uh, uh, organizations here in the United States. And it's very specific to binding phosphorus. Um, it doesn't impact water quality when, you, when it's used like some other phosphorus binding agents. And it creates a, you know, a permanent bond that only gets stronger through time. And you know, in essence, will never re-release the, um, the phosphorus in any condition that would be found in a natural environment. Uh, very low risk to human health and the environment. Um, in fact, the, the active ingredient lanthanum is used in a, in a prescription um, product for humans when they have issues with uh, phosphates in their blood and um, due to uh, various diseases. Um, so it's, you know, it has a very strong proven track record for human health and the environment. Um, from a technical standpoint for Utah Lake, uh, Phosloc kind of rises to the top of phosphorus mitigation tools because um, it works in high pH. It's very good in, in shallow lakes, 
um, that experience sediment resuspension like Utah Lake. Uh, and it also, uh, there are a number of uh, peer reviewed literature uh, studies out there that, that show how the, the matrix of the bentonite clay in Fosslock helps stable, stabilize those loose sediments. Um, so that in itself can also help um, reduce um, sediment resuspension of phosphorus. Next slide. Um, you know, so the goal of that would be to, um, you know, eventually potentially do a large scale treatment. Um, we see, um, you know, based on some of the, um, the information and some of the goals that are outlined um, that you shared, Scott, in the um, coming from the scientific uh, science panel, um, you know, one of the best ways to measure mitigation is to do in situ trials. And um, that would, that is what we would propose as a next step. Um, you know, we would propose um, potentially a couple sites around the lake um, that have various types of sediment, whereas Provo Bay has some of the highest sediment load or phosphorus load um, across the lake, um, whereas Utah Lake is more in that average um, I would say average sediment condition. So those are two potential sites where it might make um, sense to do some kind of in situ um, treatment and monitoring program uh, to help guide future management. Next slide. So, um, you know, our job is to um, help you as needed, when needed, um, you know, with solutions we have. Uh, but we do believe we have technology and, and expertise uh, to help um, achieve some of the goals. And I, I think some of the things listed on here are very similar to some of the goals um, that Scott went over earlier, um, but certainly reduce the occurrence, the size and frequency of harmful algal blooms and the impacts that those could potentially have on recreation or human health, um, as well as the wildlife. Uh, and, you know, I think the ultimate goal of the Utah Lake Commission, or one of the ultimate goals is to, you know, help imp improve the public perception of Utah Lake, uh, you know, which will help foster more use and economic growth. And then certainly, um, you know, enhancing water quality to help with the fish restoration and conservation goals. And um, at the end of the day, make Utah Lake a, a great natural resource, but also an excellent uh, economic driver for the community. And you know, I think that's an, as I look at uh, the, the communities surrounding um, Utah Lake, they're growing um, amongst the fastest of any, any areas in the country. Um, lots of people coming and it, at least not being from Utah, but having lived out West for a while, um, people like to move out there for the, the great recreational opportunities um, that uh, can hopefully go along with good jobs. And uh, I believe that's uh, all we had on our end. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan and Scott. Um, are there any questions for them? We've got a couple of questions. Uh, so you say the uh, phospholock permanently binds the phosphorus, uh, you know, for normal operations of the lake. If there was any dredging that occurred, would that reintroduce the phosphorus or cause it to uptake? Um, well, disturbing the sediment would not uh, would not cause that phospholock to release um, would not cause that phospholock to release. Um, you couldn't get any natural conditions out there that would break that bond. Um, you know, the only potential would be. I mean, well, put it this way: if that bond gets broken, it's going to be a water quality condition that no life will live in the lake. You'd have to have, uh, you know. Uh, pH levels down below, you know, one and a half, um, as an example, to break that bond, which, you know, the lake wouldn't be supporting any life if that happened anyways. Um, so there's no natural condition that will break that bond. And then the next question, does the bentonite layer anything, does that, does that prohibit any vegetation growth on the bottom of the lake, the sediment and stuff? No, I mean, clay is certainly a matrix of I, my guess is there's bentonite clay in the bottom sediments of, of Utah Lake today at some level. I don't know that level, but clays are certainly a, a natural part of the, of the matrix of any soil or almost any soil. So um, there wouldn't be any impact 
um, I would imagine to macrophyte growth. Um, and, you know, besides the lanthanum binding the phosphorus, what a number of studies have found is that um, bentonite clay, if you know what it is, it's a very sticky clay. It's very tacky. Um, it's an excellent way to help stabilize loose, um, unconsolidated um, sediments and organics. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Scott, I do have one, if you don't mind. So, you know, the lake is really good at retaining phosphorus, uh, for example. And so uh, it's pretty well understood that about 90% of the phosphorus that comes in annually is sequestered to the sediments. Um, so my read on that is that you're, you know, there's a constant replenishment of phosphorus, new phosphorus that's being deposited through the sediments. How does that relate to a uh, long-term plan, management plan with the use of phospholock um, to be able to accommodate for those new sources? Does that require additional annual treatments as long as if there's new sources coming in or um, some other method? Well, that's a, I think a two part answer. One is the best way to answer those questions would be to do in situ trials. And we have had some preliminary discussions with uh, uh, BYU on some laboratory studies. In fact, I believe that they have collected some sediment samples for us. Um, the best way to get definitive answers on that though would be to do some in situ studies um, beyond that, though, I mean, um, the amount of phosphorus that's in the pour water, sediment, pour water, and sediment today is so high that if we were to do mitigation at scale, it would last for many, many years as far as a practical improvement to the water quality of Utah Lake. Um, yes, so it's, um, it's, it's interesting, Scott. We were on a call a few weeks ago with, um, with your organization and, and Erica Gladys and, and other members of your team, and you, you weren't able to make that call, but some similar questions came up. And it's, um, where was I going? Um, basically, um, it's not an and or an or, and we had a specific discussion on this. We don't need to mitigate the phosphorus levels in the sediment only. You need to clean up the watershed, certainly. You need to reduce other inputs that are significant. But honestly, the data that I've seen on the lake to date uh, would suggest that likely the greatest contributor is the sediment phosphorus okay. that's in the lake today. Yeah, and there we do have some active studies with the science panel to evaluate those relative contributions. But, um, you know, in those hotspot areas that you showed on the map, I would think that the source of that phosphorus came from an external source, right? Um, and is being recycled in the column from the sediments. So next full circle, but thanks for that. Um, Shelly Turnbow asked a question if um, you had mentioned the price of, phos of phospholock. Um, do you have a per unit area or per unit price? Well, it's highly variable. I mean, the, the price of the, the product varies by scale, certainly, as, as most um, formulated products. Um, you're generally looking at $1.30 to $2 a pound for Phoslock. But the more important question is how many pounds of phosphorus per acre need to be mitigated. Um, so we see... Um, so for instance, just to give you kind of a relative term, just from the data that we have, we've looked at so far, um, you have incredibly high uh, levels of phosphorus in many areas of, of um, Utah Lake. Uh, some of these areas exceed the levels we see in the sediments of, um, of phosphorus mine lakes in the state of Florida. Um, so you're looking at a potential range across the lake. Some areas might only need a couple thousand pounds of phospholock to the acre. Um, other areas, um, the parts of Provo Bay, on a, they might need 15,000 pounds of phospholock to the acre. Uh, so it, the real, the, really the question is how many pounds of phosphorus need to be mitigated? Okay. Uh, that drives cost. That makes sense. Okay, thank you for that. All right, any remaining questions? 
Okay, um, great. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate your time today. Um, I assume you'll be able to make this presentation available for the technical committee. Yep. Okay. Great. Yeah, if you could just send that to Sam or Eric, that would be great. Um, thanks again. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, um, moving on to the communications uh, strategy, Sam, would you like to walk us through that? Yeah, I will keep this real brief for the community. I know we're short on time. Um, Yep. yep. Thanks, Eric. Just reminded me to keep it on schedule here. Uh, long story short, just wanted to update some brief things. The website's being improved. So we just wanted to say a thank you to CUWCD. They're providing uh, an API key, which is basically a way to constantly update the water level data, as you see on the right side of the screen there. Um, that they have on their site. We'll be able to replicate that now on our own website for anybody who's visiting Utah Lake specifically. So a thank you to them for that. Um, I thank you to Linda Marina. They actually have got their live camera feed up and running. So there's now one at the state park and also at Linda Marina. We're looking at the other marinas as uh, options in the future. Um, and then the next one I wanted to cover was, or cover was just a thank you to MAG, Mountain Land Association of Governments, the Utah Lake Trail Plan uh, that is displayed on our website and also on their um, GIS map. They were able to add the access points, which is a request that came from uh, one of the committee members here in our meeting in June. And so we were able to collaborate with them and get that added to the trail plan. So now anybody who looks at trails at the lake can also see which access points and can click on them and learn about what options are available there. So definitely a great uh, improvement. And then last uh, in June, we talked about uh, you all with the Adopt a Shoreline program, um, adding additional areas. So June of 2020, we had just the 27 access points were adoptable and 26 of those were adopted. Um, we actually updated that. We realized there was a, a, a mistake on that, that the state park has been adopted by a group that's caring for it already. Uh, so we added almost double the amount of areas. You'll notice there as of this month, 45 areas are now able to be adopted. That includes public access points. Uh, there are sections of trail that have been broken up for adoption. Um, and there are a couple of city parks and other areas of, of a public, publicly accessible shoreline that we wanted to have cared for. Uh, since we added those, we're now up to 41 of those 45 have been adopted. And so it's really great to see uh, dedicated hunters and families and businesses helping to care for the shoreline and keep litter off the shoreline so that people can enjoy it. Um, we looked at some of the statistics from the reporting. Um, we started in July of this year, uh, an online reporting form to try and track some of this. And since then there have been 72 cleanups done, 282 hours of service is the estimate on that. Um, with the value of the volunteers time estimated at almost $8,000. So just some great successes to see that uh, people are really willing to give of their time and help keep the shoreline clean. Uh, so those are the items that I have on communications. So thank you for the time on that, Scott. Excellent. Thanks, Sam. Um, any feedback, questions, comments for Sam? I'd just point out that as part of that um, Central Utah water data, uh, it's also allowing us to uh, maintain an updated water chart uh, from the original chart that Stephen Thurin built with Central Utah Water. And so we will be able to keep that um, not live per se, but, but updated periodically through the year so that we'll, folks that are giving presentations and so forth talking about water levels over time will have a, a very updated version of that readily available uh, for use in the future. Thanks, Eric. Okay, I think we'll uh, move into the round table. Um, just without knowing uh, where- Were we gonna get an update from Mike? Oh, sorry, I looked over that one again too. Uh, my apologies. And uh, yeah, I thought we were doing better on time. So Mike, um, Mike Mills, we'll turn to you for an update on the June Sucker program. Yeah, thank you, Scott. I'll, I just have a few slides here that I will, I'll try to move through um, relatively quickly. Um, I appreciate the opportunity just to fill in the technical committee with what um, the June Sucker Program has been up to for 2020 and then looking forward to 2021. Um, 
Utah Lake Carp, carp removal, as many of you are aware, this has been a long-term project that continues to move forward. Um, we achieved our original goals of reducing the biomass of common carp in Utah Lake by over 75%. Um, that was accomplished back in 2017. Since that time, we've continued to remove adults in order to keep the population suppressed. And then in 2020, we formed what we've been calling the CARP Task Force with representatives from the state, also Utah State University, um, our commercial fishing crew, um, to really plan out our next approach for addressing CARP on Utah Lake. We came up with this three-pronged attack. As I mentioned, we're continuing to remove adults also exploring our ability to target small-bodied carp. That's meant testing out some different gear out on Utah Lake during 2020, and then also kind of switching up the areas where the commercial fishermen have been fishing to try to target these younger carp that have really evaded our more traditional um, removal techniques. And then the third prong of that approach has been researching some of the novel control strategies that um, continue to get pre proposed out there. These have ranged from poison baits to genetic modifications to, um, in Australia, they, they're researching a virus to target carp. Um, this, these, these at times can be quite extreme, um, but we feel it's important that we remain engaged in these areas in case there is a solution that comes up that may have some application to Utah Lake that could be utilized without having a lot of collateral damage out there. Um, with that in mind for 2021, we will continue the removal of adults to suppress the population. And then we're also hoping to expand this targeting of, of small bodied carp out there. As the adult population was reduced, we have seen uh, a compensatory response in those younger individuals that are um, evading our, our gear type. So that's why the focus on that, on those smaller bodied fish. Um, another project that we're really excited about and has been a long time coming has been the Provo River Delta restoration project. I've tried to keep everyone updated on this um, as things have progressed. We started working on this back in March. Um, just as a reminder, this is the project to restore the connection between the Provo River and Utah Lake. It's about almost 300 acres just kind of north of Utah Lake State Park. The project's progress has actually been really good. We've been able to work really fast and accomplish much more than we were anticipating for this first construction season. And that's been mostly due to dry conditions that have allowed us to, to move quicker than, than what we had originally planned. The focus has been just the excavation of ponds and the future river channels that would be um, utilized when the project is completed and a portion of the Provo River is diverted into the Delta. If anybody's looking for updates, we, we have ProvoRiverDelta.us is the project website that gets updated every two weeks with a, a construction progress map. And then you can also access our latest newsletter or, or sign up to receive that newsletter electronically. Um, this is our updated map. This is actually a couple weeks old at this point. Um, all the gray areas and brown and tan areas were all the project features that we are planning to build. Um, we expect construction to take until 2024, but the blue area is what we've been able to complete. Um, these are the different channels and ponds that have all been excavated out there. The brown area is where we've gone in and constructed some riparian mounds these are elevated surfaces that add to the habitat diversity out there on site. Um, one of the things that have allowed us to make a lot of progress has been this swamp mat road that was put in um, before the project started um, that has allowed good access to a lot of these areas and 
allowed the equipment to move around um, relatively easily. And so our focus with most of the excavation done for the year, we've focused on revegetating a lot of these areas, mostly the riparian mounds, and then also the margins of the channels and the, the different ponds that have been dug out there. With us completing excavation in this kind of northwest corner, we don't plan to be back in this area again until we start working on removing Skipper Bay Dyke. So it will be a couple of years before we are back in here and we're hoping the vegetation that we've went out and planted will be able to get hold and, and start to kind of fill in a lot of the bare dirt areas so we aren't don't have as many noxious weed problems moving into the future. Um, here's a, just a quick aerial photo that was taken of the project oh, almost a month ago, but you can really start to see, you know, how water is going to look in these channels. Um, right now, the only water that is on site is groundwater and then a little bit of flow coming in through the Despain Ditch. Um, some people call this Carp Creek that flows along the northern part of the, bound of the project. And right now there's a plug in the dike, so that water doesn't go into Utah Lake. So some of it is back feeding into this channel, but that's a relatively small amount of water. And so the majority of water you see on the site is actually groundwater. And then we are still actively pumping water out down in this area to try to keep conditions to a point where we're able to excavate and dig. Um, most of the excavation is on hold for the next um, week as the crew has moved on to a different project, but they were able to relocate the Swamp Mat Road to allow excavation to proceed on some of these areas when, when they are able to get back to this. Um, I could talk more about that, but let's go ahead and move on. Um, Northern Pike, I think most people are aware this was a fish species that was illegally introduced to the lake somewhere around 2010 and has the potential to have some pretty big negative impacts on the fish community. For 2020, we were able to complete our Northern Pike Control Strategy document um, in cooperation with the Division of Wildlife Resources. Um, that document kind of lays out our next steps in, in moving forward on addressing the pike problem. Our focus for the last few months, and it will be again moving into 2021, has been trying to get um, telemetry tags out into Northern Pike so that we can track them and, and get a good idea of what areas of the lake these pike use. And that will help inform both our monitoring and then also our, our control efforts moving forward. And then finally, I, I've been talking this up. You've probably heard most of most many people talking this up over the last year. We are still anticipating, kind of waiting on the edge of our seats for the Fish and Wildlife Service to release the final downlisting rule that will upgrade the June sucker from endangered status to threatened. Um, if you recall, the proposed rule was issued back in November of 2019. It's gone through an extensive review process. We get updates continually on, on where this is at. We were told to expect it by the end of the year. And so we're, we're kind of running out of time that it, it could still go into 2021, but hopefully any day now we get the final publication of this rule um, that really represents a pretty big accomplishment for all of our partners that participate in the recovery program to be able to take a fish that was on the brink of extinction and bring it back to where we're, we're talking about it, it being recovered. Um, the, there won't be really a huge change once the rule is finalized. The June Sucker Program will continue to implement recovery actions as our goal is really to have the species completely delisted and removed from protection under the Endangered Species Act. Something that you know, with, with this rule is, is now on the horizon and we can look forward to. Um, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and wrap up and just, you know, Russ Franklin introduced himself at the start of the call um, that Russ has accepted 
um, the job with the Central Utah Water Conservancy District and will serve as the June Sucker Recovery Program's local project coordinator moving forward um, as I move on to the Mitigation Commission. Um, I, I hope to remain involved in the Utah Lake Commission where I can and continue to participate in meetings. Um, but I, I know Russ will do a great job and he will become a, a familiar face for all of you as, as part of the commission. So with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and wrap up, Scott. I'd be happy to answer any questions or, or anything else. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, welcome, Russ. Um, it's nice to have you on board. And congratulations, Mike, and your your next uh, phase of work. It's pretty exciting. Um, and uh, thanks for that update. I know a couple of those projects, you know, are kind of long coming for you know your program. And I know many of us here are excited to see those progress and finally be moving forward on a couple of them. Um, are there any questions for Mike? Briefly. Okay. Um, great, thanks. And then I know um, Sullivan and um, Eric had a little discussion in the chat box about potential tour of the Provo Delta. Um, I think that's probably something, Eric, that we could put together for the spring, um, working with Mike and Melissa. Or when um, I'm, Russ or Melissa would think would be the best time to do that. That okay. the spring is too wet, I don't know, but. Great, something that we can definitely Put on, um, yeah, on the we, we go ahead, Mike. Yeah, we'd be happy to hope for down there for the technical committee, the governing board. Um, we'll, we'll kind of see how the spring goes, but we'll find a good time. Okay, great, excellent. Um, thanks again, Mike. Appreciate that update. Uh, we'll move now to our, our round table. Um, Maybe we'll give this a shot through the through the use of raising hands. Are there any members of the technical committee that have some information to provide in the roundtable segment? Um, if so, in the participant list, you can see uh, raise hand feature if you hit the three little dots at the bottom of the participant list. Okay. Um, and then we'll move in. Once that's wrapped up, we'll move into the general public comments, if that's all right. Um, okay, great. Um, Jeff, if you don't mind, we'll start with Sullivan and then pick up on your comments here in a moment. Thanks. I don't have a lot to contribute at this time, but I just do want to update that, you know, we received the, the grant. We are quickly moving forward with plans to, uh, uh, you know, get develop, uh, plans developed and uh, contracts implemented and stuff to, to do work on the lakeshore and continue improving it. If you've been to the Vineyard Beach area, you'll notice that we continue to do cleanup as we're, you know, as we have time to, to remove some of the invasive species and, and uh, rake the, the sand and stuff like that. Okay. Great, excellent, Sullivan. Thank you for that. Uh, any questions for Sullivan? Okay, any other roundtable items from uh, members of the technical committee? Okay, uh, we'll move on to the public comment section. Uh, Jeff Demblaker with CH2 with Jacobs. Yeah, um, I'm working with the Tippenoga Special Service District and just wanna let you all know that they will be issuing a request for proposals, hopefully here in the next week or two uh, to do some limno corral um, in situ studies uh, next year. Uh, to look at some of these potential ideas for long-term um, restoration of, of the lake. So they, they have a, one liminal corral in the lake right now. We're just looking at how it performs during wind events and um, but hope to hire some researchers, get some re researchers on board to do the full study starting next spring. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Okay, any other comments, members of the public? Okay. Um, with that, we'll move into wrapping up, uh, looking at our meeting schedule. We have the next uh, scheduled technical committee meeting for um, February 17th at 10 o'clock. Um, 
you know, slated for the state park, but I imagine there'll be um, a significant virtual component unless things change dramatically between now and then. So we'll keep you up to date on, uh, on that meeting moving forward. Um, just again, a reminder, we have the governing board meetings tomorrow morning. Um, so look forward to that if you plan to attend to it. And then um, just lastly, the schedule for the remainder of the year after the February meeting, uh, we're looking for technical committee meetings for the 21st of April, 9th of June, 20th of October, and the 1st of December. Um, any comments or questions on the meeting schedule? Concerns? Okay, great, well, excellent. Um, Thank you all today for your attendance and uh, patience as we go over the agenda here by 15 minutes. Definitely a lot to talk about today, so we appreciate you hanging with us. Um, I guess with that, we'll uh, take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, second? Second. Okay, great. Thank you all. Um, take care and we'll see you on the 17th of February. Thanks, Scott. Oh, I'm not sure. Thank you and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Yeah. <laughs>